Hey guys, Mr. P here. In this video, we're going to talk specifically about all of the structures that are outside of a prokaryotic cell wall. Um, as you can see by this thumbnail image, that there are actually quite a bit of structuring um, or quite a bit of structuring that takes place on the outside of the cell wall. We typically, uh, within cellular biology or microbiology, always assume that the cell wall is the outermost structure within any cell, but that is um, false. Okay, There are a lot of things that bacteria and prokaryotes specifically have on the outside of their cell wall that allows them to live in the environments that they inhabit. So we're going to focus on all of the external structuring, um, specifically the structures that are outside of the cell wall in this particular video. So when you look holistically at a prokaryote, um, whether you look inside or outside of the cell wall, you can see that there are a variety of familiar structures. You know, typically things like flagella are very... Um, very easy to recognize. We have structures inside of the cell wall, specifically inside of the membrane, like the nucleoid region, which consists of a singular chromosome that is naked, meaning it doesn't have histones. We've talked about that in previous videos, and we'll continue to talk about that in future videos. Um, you have things like plasmids, which are smaller accessory rings of DNA. You have uh, ribosomes, you have cytoplasm, you have the cell membrane, you have um, enzymes and small areas that these enzymes are kept in. You have pili around the outside. Like I said before, you have flagella. But I wanted to focus on these layers. The plasma membrane, just like any cell, is uh, specifically to this prokaryote, is on the inside of the cell wall, and it is the boundary between the inside and outside of the cell. So you would see that the cytoplasm is directly interior of the plasma membrane, just on the outside of the plasma membrane consists of the cell wall. Now, the cell wall can differentiate uh, or uh, be a difference. Okay, There are differences associated with the cell wall in both prokaryote and eukaryote cells. There are also differences within um, gram-positive and gram-negative bacterial cell walls that we will get into next video. But um, on the outside of the cell wall, you will see that there is a capsule, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. So capsule is this thick layer that exists on the outside of the cell wall in some prokaryotes. Not all bacteria have them, but some of them do. And as you'll see in a little bit, the capsule really helps to protect the cell from a lot of biochemical processing that takes place within a host cell if it is a prokaryote that causes disease. So um, just kind of wanted to give an overview of all of the structures that are in a prokaryote so that um, as we talk about these in more depth, you kind of have a, a framework or a reference uh, to kind of build upon. So the glycocalyx is a term that needs to be understood. Okay, Glycocalyx kind of means sugar coat, and this is the uh, area around the outside of the cell wall that can include the capsule or a slime layer. Okay. Um, these, like I said, are external to the cell wall. They are very viscous and gelatinous, meaning they have kind of a sticky, a lot of times a, a sticky nature. They are made specifically of polysaccharides or and or polypeptides. Again, polypeptides are proteins, polysaccharides are sugar. This is a, a, a protein sugar coat or a protein sugar um, exterior covering. There are two types, like I said, there's a capsule and a slime layer. A capsule is very condensed, firmly attached, neatly organized, and really closely surrounds the bacterium. You actually can see in this micrograph bacteria that have a capsule present. And uh, when staining, it's often easy to determine if a bacteria cell has a capsule present by utilizing a negative stain protocol. So negative staining, remember, stains the background, not the bacteria. And so if we stain the bacteria, uh, or if we stain the background, and there is a capsule present, you can see that the, the bacteria itself is in the middle of kind of this halo. Well, that halo isn't nothing, right? It's not the bacteria just repelling the stain. It is the bacteria's... Um, outside covering or the capsule that takes up that space uh, in order to kind of give us this particular view view so employ negative staining protocols in order to determine if a bacteria has a capsule now when we compare that to a slime layer it is kind of the opposite of the capsule it still surrounds the bacteria but it is unorganized 
It is loosely attached or loosely adherent. There is no uniformity to it. There is no uniformity to de uh, density or the thickness, and it uh, really is a lot less organized overall um, and a lot more sprawling than the capsule. Slime layers typically allow bacteria to attach to their environment and form biofilms. Capsules kind of are more protective of the cell, uh, which is why it needs to be more organized and really kind of more densely focused to uh, surrounding the cell. So what is that glycocalyx for? Well, I have here a slide that has two different types of bacteria. One is obviously kind of a, uh, a coccus bacteria, and one of them is a bacillus. But um, the one on the left is bacillus anthracis. That is the bacteria responsible for anthrax. Uh, and it particularly or specifically produces a capsule that is made of D-glutamic acid, which results in abnormal amino acid profiles and avoids phagocytosis of the host cell. Now, there's a reason this particular bacteria causes disease in a host, and that is because it avoids the phagocytotic um, bioprocessing that takes place um, from our immune response or our, our immune system, and because of that capsule safeguards the bacteria from being broken down by our normal immune response. Okay, On the right, you have streptococcus pneumonia, um, this is the particular uh, round uh, spherical shaped bacteria that causes pneumonia. However, it only causes pneumonia when the cells are protected by their polysaccharide capsule. Okay? That strain of bacteria is not capable of producing pneumonia in a host when the capsule isn't present. When the capsule is present, it can produce and will produce pneumonia. Again, you can see that both of these result in um, an increased pathogenicity because both cells have the ability to protect themselves against the phagocytotic, uh, the phagocytotic uh, bioprocessing that takes place within the host. So to summarize, what is the glycocalyx for? The capsule is very important in contributing to bacterial virulence by protecting the bacteria from phagocytosis. Our normal immune response wants to employ a process called phagocytosis, which brings in these bacteria cells into our normal macrophages and other immune response cells in order to break them down. The capsule helps protect these bacteria, and if they're protected, they can lead to an increase in virulence or an increase in pathogenicity. They can cause disease at a higher and quicker rate. Okay, So what is this glycocalyx for kind of continued? The glycocalyx is very important in can, uh, a very important component of biofilms. Now, what is a biofilm? I used that term in the previous slide. A biofilm is a film on a structure. Think of, you know, the, the easiest way to put it is think of teeth and plaque. That is an example of biofilm. Bacteria that are present on a surface can secrete this EPS, which is extracellular polymeric substance, which helps not only to protect the cell, which is down here in blue in this particular diagram. It also helps to adhere or attach the bacteria to a particular surface. Okay. Um, in addition to protecting the cell and attaching it to a surface, it actually helps promote and facilitate communication among the cells. So this particular cell can send signals out and can actually communicate via this chemical signaling to adjacent cells through this EPS. So extracellular polymeric substance, EPS, not only protects the cell by basically kind of creating this cloud around the outside of the cell so that our normal um, immune response, phagocytic bioprocessing can't get to the cell and uh, dissolve it as well as it should be able to do. It also facilitates communication among them and enables this particular bacteria, um, in addition to protecting it, to adhere and attach to the particular substance. So if we're talking about teeth and we're talking about the biofilm that is secreted by the bacteria in your mouth, that's what we call plaque. The plaque can actually be very stubborn and very hard to get off, especially if it is allowed to harden. And that is because these biofilms are very good at repelling all of the normal um, safeguards we have like the enzymes associated with saliva and things that we have to help keep our mouth clean. 
okay? Moving into the flagella. So we've talked in depth kind of about that glycocalyx. We've talked about the biofilm and the capability of the bacteria to produce the biofilm. We've talked about the slime layers and the capsule. And so we're moving down um, kind of to the base of the particular structure or the base of the cell in order to look at how a flagella is structured and how a flagella is anchored to the plasma membrane. Notice that we have two different scenarios here. We have gram-negative bacteria, which I'll just mark with a big minus sign, and we have gram-positive bacteria, which I will put just a positive sign. There is a big difference between the cell wall of a gram-positive bacteria and a gram-negative bacteria. You can see that, like the most noticeable difference in my opinion, is that the gram-negative bacteria actually has one, two, cell membranes, meaning two full lipid bilayers with the cell wall sandwiched between them. You'll also notice that typically the cell wall um, is much thinner in a gram-negative bacteria than it is in the gram-positive bacteria. Now, I know that when we look at this diagram, it looks like those cell walls are the same thickness. I'm just telling you that in all actuality, if this wasn't just an artistic rendition of the cell wall, you would notice that this one is much thicker on the gram-positive bacteria than it is in the gram-negative. So if we kind of throw out the differences among the gram-positive and gram-negative cell wall and plasma membranes and focus on exactly what the flagella is, because in both cases, the flagella is external of the cell wall, which is the purpose of this video. So we're talking about the structuring that protrudes on the outside of the cell wall, and one of those structures is a flagella if it is present. The flagella is made of the protein flagellin, and it helps the cell propel itself around its environment. So not only does it protrude outside of the cell wall, it allows the bacterium to move around its environment. Now that's important when we are talking about kind of the metabolism of a cell. The cell obviously needs to be able to move to and from different external stimuli. It needs to be able to move to and from food sources. It needs to be able to move to and from light sources, um, you know, move to and from um, certain toxic chemicals and stuff like that. So the cell needs to be able to move just like we do to find more suitable habitat. The flagella helps it do that. Okay. Now, the way that the flagella is structured is that in both cases, regardless of gram positive or negative, there is a filament. Okay. Filament makes up the main structure of the flagella. That is the structure that, or the, the string, so to speak, that protrudes from the cell wall. In both cases, there's a hook, which is going to allow the filament to move. It's kind of the, um, I don't know, the pendulum or kind of the, the gear that moves the filament. And then you have a basal body, which is down here, actually anchored within the cell wall and cell membrane that allows it to not only anchor itself, but to help facilitate movement as well. Okay, focusing on this particular cell, you have the filament, like I said, that's the outermost region that is made of the protein flagellin. You have the hook, which attaches the filament to the cell, and you have the basal body, which consists of rods and pairs of rings to anchor the flagellum to the cell wall and membrane. All of these, the hook and basal body, helps to promote movement of the filament. Okay, so we are moving the filament with the hook and basal body. The filament is the actual whip-like propeller that helps uh, move the cell around its environment. Okay, so... Gram-negative bacteria have two pairs of rings. You can see them here. Okay, two pairs of rings. Inner pair of rings is anchored to the cell membrane, and the outer pair of rings is anchored to various portions of the cell wall. This is the first pair. That is the second pair. Notice the first pair, like it said, is anchored to the cell membrane. The second pair is anchored not only to the cell wall, but also anchored to the second membrane or the outer membrane. In gram-positive bacteria, you only have one pair of rings which are anchored to the cell membrane, just like they are in the gram-negative bacteria. Okay. Flagella structure, you will see when you look at a variety of cells under microscopy techniques or within a microscopy techniques, you will see that it is possible for bacteria to have a single, two, many, or completely lack of flagella. Paratrichus is a term that is used to, um, dis dis to describe 
the cell that has a bunch of different flagella that are distributed across the entire surface. You will see that there are flagella that are actually distributed evenly and kind of randomly among the entire surface of the cell. We call that paratrichus. Monotrichus is when a cell has a single flagella, like a human sperm cell. That is a monotrichus cell. Monotrichus typically is associated with polar because if you have one, you typically are only going to have it in the pole. Um, there are cells that are monotrichus that aren't in the pole, okay? But this would be an example of a cell that is monotrichus and polar, or polar monotrichus. This particular cell is lophotrichus and polar. It means that there are a bunch of flagella, so multiple flagella, but one pole is where all of them originate. Okay, so you'll look at this cell. It has a bunch of different flagella, and they all originate in the exact same place. Amphitrichus and polar. Amphitrichus is when you have flagella at both poles, but nowhere else along the surface of the cell. Okay, so paratrichus, monotrichus, lophotrichus, amphitrichus. Make sure you know those terms. Uh, we will need to be able to differentiate when we look at cells under the microscope. How does the flagella specifically aid in cellular movement? There are two terms that you have to understand. One of them is tumbling and one is running. Running is when the flagella are being kind of spun clock or counterclockwise. Okay, So when a cell, um, basically these flagella are going to be rotating like a string on a fan blade. Okay, if you can think about that. So if you put a string on a fan blade and you turn the fan on, um, you would literally from the side be able to see that particular string oscillating along its rotation. Okay, that's the way that these flagella move. And whether they move them counterclockwise or clockwise depends on what actually happens to the cell. When the flagella are rotated counterclockwise, the cell will move in one direction. We call that running. When the uh, flagella are turned or rotated clockwise, we call that tumbling. The cell actually won't go anywhere. It will just kind of turn on its axis. Okay. So if a cell that had flagella wanted to turn 90 degrees and go a different direction, it would turn or rotate its flagella clockwise. That would allow this cell to turn, okay, literally face this direction, and then it could spin them or rotate them counterclockwise, and it would then run in this direction, okay? Bacteria can alter the speed and direction of the rotation of the flagella and are capable of various patterns of motility. Again, like I said, there is a run and tumble. Run is when they move for a length of time in one direction. Tumble is when they look random, abrupt, periodic um, rotations among their axis. Um, it allows them to turn and then run a different direction. When you look at a cell under a microscope that is alive and is moving, you will see that there is a bunch of kind of segmented movements. The cell will run, run, tumble, run, tumble, tumble run, 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 tumble, okay? It looks like it's pretty spastic movement, but it just has to turn its or rotate its flagella in opposite directions. It allows it to turn and then run, um, which is how it moves itself around its environment. Now, we call two terms chemotaxis and phototaxis. Taxis is the way that it moves to and from a stimulus. Typically, Motility is going to allow a bacterium to move toward a favorable environmental uh, stimulus and move away from an adverse one. And that makes total sense. If you were in your environment, which you are, you're not likely wanting to run towards an unfavorable stimulus. You're going to want to get away from an unfavorable stimulus. Cells are the same way. If there is a chemical stimuli, we call it chemotaxis. If it is a light stimuli, then it's phototaxis. Some cells like to move towards light, and some like to move away from light. Some like to move towards a particular chemical. Some like to move away from a particular chemical. 
some are going to, well, most are going to move away from a chemical toxin that kind of enters their environment, okay, much like we would. Um, but they can tumble and run kind of depending on what environmental condition they're exposed to and what environmental stimulus they either think is favorable or adverse. Last thing to talk about is what is called axial filaments. Okay, an axial filament is something, is a protein component that can be seen in spirochetes. If you remember from last lecture or a couple lectures ago, we talked about the particular shapes and orientations associated with bacterial kind of nomenclature. One of the bacterial shapes was the spiral group. Spirochete is one of those bacteria that is very spirally and very long. They have unique structure and motility. They do not have uh, cilia, they do not have flagella, but they have what's called these axial filaments. And what you should think about is it's basically kind of like a flagella. It's protein in nature, but it's wrapped tightly around the whole kind of exterior of the cell. And it allows these spiral bacteria to move kind of like a corkscrew and kind of rotate through their environment, so to speak. So they don't have an actual whip-like tail or whip-like propeller um, that is kind of indicative of the um, filament associated with the um, flagella, but they do have these protein components that allows them to corkscrew through their environment. Okay. Fimbrae and pili, these are things that are also external to the cell wall. The fimbrae are hair-like appendages that allow for attachment. You can see them here. They basically are on the outside, kind of um, covering the entire outside and allows them to specifically attach and adhere themselves to their environmental surface. Pili are tiny hair-like projections that are similar to fimbrae, but they are specifically moved in motility or conjugation. So in this particular diagram, you can see that there are a bunch of little tiny hair-like projections. Those are the normal pili. And then we have this really kind of long, thick projection. That's called a conjugation pilus. That is made of the same structures that the smaller pili are used, but the pili that are small are used to move the cell. This conjugation pilus is a large kind of straw-like tube that is hollow, and it allows it to transfer plasmid and bacterial DNA from one cell to another. We call that conjugation. And while it's not a sexual reproduction method or a sexual reproduction process, it allows bacteria, which are asexual reproducers, to kind of mirror or get closer to the process of sexual reproduction by actually allowing them to um, give or donate different DNA components from one cell to another. Okay, That wraps up our lecture on prokaryotic external structuring. Uh, in the next video, we're going to dive into the kind of the interior of a cell and talk about the different processes and the different structures associated with prokaryotes, um, specifically on the inside of the cell wall. Okay. So this video was on outside of the cell wall. Then we're going to dive in and go interior of the cell wall. Bring your questions to class. See ya.